Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining today. Black Tech Fest 2023. Can we get a round of applause for everybody attending today? Give yourself a round of applause too for being here. This is amazing, amazing experience. So as I mentioned, I'm Anthony Reynolds from JP Morgan Chase, I'm the head of entrepreneurship within DEI, the Office of Disability and Inclusion. And I'm proud today to be here uh, representing our firm as the official accessibility sponsor for this event. Um, and I, I'm on stage here to talk today about diversity and accessibility, why it matters. I have some great panelists here who I'd like to give a quick introduction. Um, I'll start with Heidi here. You know, where are you from? How did you get here today? And maybe something interesting about yourself. <laughs> well, despite the accent, <laughs> I am a Londoner now, 23 years here. You know what I was going to say, Anthony, how lucky are we? We work for JP Morgan where we're paid. Our full-time job is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I honestly do think that I've got the privilege of representing a very underserved community and underserved communities and to work for a company that has full-time roles dedicated to that. Uh, 23 years in uh, the UK, I came over as a tech grad in a rotation program in tech infrastructure. That's what brought me over here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I've been front office, back office, M&A in sales, but about six months ago decided enough with shareholder value. I actually want to work on breaking down barriers for people with disabilities. So you were in the business, like you were with a banking team and kind of driving revenue and you wanted to switch to diversity, equity, inclusion? Yeah, I know some of my sales colleagues thought that was a bit of a bold move, <laughs> but um, it's certainly been a meaningful one. And then equally, I'm bringing in a unique perspective into diversity, equity, and inclusion because actually, it does make a difference to bottom line. And today we're gonna to talk about why it's important in innovation, in fintechs, uh, definitely including it in your entrepreneurial lens. Excellent, thank you so much. And our next panelist, please, an introduction. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andre Skeppel. Um, before I actually talk about what I do, let me give a bit of a brief introduction of my story. So um, I'm dyspraxic and dyslexic, and I've recently been identified with a bit of a sprinkling of ADHD. I was diagnosed very late, so I was diagnosed um, at 21 years old in my second university. It took me five years to be identified being neurodivergent to get the additional support in school. Upon that discovery, I then realized that, well, I'm not the only person that actually has been discovered as being neurodivergent. In fact, this is a, a growing population of people, particularly those from minority backgrounds, that have gone through their entire curriculum and also their professional life, not understanding why is it that they can't do certain things, but also why is it that they can do certain things with require superpowers. And so through that whole journey and the whole journey of including neurodiversity in the concepts of diversity and inclusion, I worked for a few years within the science industry. I uh, was a scientist and worked in business development. And then during that time, I used to do a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies, research institutes, and some of the top universities across the world. I then came across a concept I used to work in called precision medicine and using diagnostics to tweak and change how to personalize therapies and um, um, you know, medicines to bring about the best outcomes, but without actually looking at things generally. And I said to myself, well, this is not used in education or in training or development. There's an opportunity here. And so upon that opportunity, that's when I decided to form a company called Full Spectrum. Uh, we are a tech company that intersects between education, health, and social care, where we are building a multi-agency intelligence platform that's designed to create neuro-inclusive environments within education, health, and social care. So think of a system that identifies if you've got dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism. It doesn't just identify, it actually creates AI to generate new environments, new strategies, new curriculums that are pertaining to your superpowers in individual and foreign personality. Wow. That's an impressive background. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your story. Could you break down a little bit, for those that may not know, what does neurodivergent mean? What is so in your mind? Neurodivergence, neurodiversity, um, essentially it's in the simplest form, how 
diverse or how sporadic our neurological makeup is. So we normally accommodate this to certain conditions such as learning disabilities, learning difficulties, specific learning difficulties, all those things there. Essentially, it's just another unique identifier of us. And so, especially in the UK, what we tend to do quite a lot is we like to put people in boxes. So you've got dyslexia, you've got dyspraxia, you've got autism, ADHD. But in my approach, one of the things I normally say when I speak about this topic is, there's no, I believe there's no such thing as being neurotypical. Everybody's neurodivergent. What we need to identify is the full spectrum of neurodiversity so that rather than put people in boxes to stigmatize their processes, we can just call ourselves Andre. Anthony, you know, this is us. So this is how we can embrace and understand that our minds are work mapped differently, our experiences also dictate in terms of how we think and process information and communicate and innovate and create and lead. And so what we need to do in this current society is to identify all those elements and bring them back to the forefront. That's powerful. Um, it, it's, it's truly remarkable, I feel like, as you give that perspective and kind of sharing, because I think it's could be slightly different for everyone um, in approach. But Heidi, do you have a perspective on that? I absolutely do. And uh, firstly, I loved, you called it your superpower. And um, I work with people with visible and invisible superpowers. And as a people manager, you know, I think we've got to get to know our talent, uh, whether it's uh, even the term disability. But what do, what do our employees need to thrive uh, what do they need if you're someone that is autistic, ADHD, uh, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or wheelchair, maybe a visual or hearing? What support? We call it reasonable adjustments, reasonable accommodations. What do you need so you can thrive? And in fact, what we've been encouraging our employees and also applicants is you can disclose if you want to. You can say, I am neurodivergent, or I have a visual, I hate the word impairment, a visual impairment. But instead, you can flip that to say, here's what I need. Here's what I need. So we've been encouraging, especially our incoming graduates and uh, apprentices and interns to talk about changing the dialogue to here's what I need to succeed and encouraging managers to get to know their talent. That's interesting. You're talking about kind of that diverse perspective and background. How have you guys both uh, benefited from diverse ideas, diverse concepts, diverse team members in your organizations? Um, I'd like to use this particular question in the framework of, you know, if you've got a whole group of people coming from the same locations of the world, studying at the same schools, uh, joined the same fraternities or sororities, and therefore there's a monolithic experience, life, commercial, professional, personal, all the experiences are very similar mirror images. If you put those same individuals in the boardroom, you put those same individuals in the lab, you put those same individuals in parliament, you're not going to get that much variation. And to be honest with you, I've just given you three examples of why those three typical areas, particularly government, is so effed up today because the same people are making the same decisions, but they're not actually having the same outlook of life. So when you look at diversity and inclusion and you look at the, the general intersectionalities that kind of interfred this concept as an emerging social economic um, you know, I mean, status or, or, or process, we have to, same way how we talk about bringing you know, more people of color, more people from, the, um, um, from African descent to, into the boardrooms to make decisions that diversify, not just in terms of the impact, the social impact, but also the commercial impact. You know, we, we have our own experiences, we have our own you know, personalities and ability to innovate and find new opportunities to create value. Now, add another layer to that and look at the neurodiversity and say, right, our experiences me being black, there's a whole bunch of black folks here, but we don't have the same experiences. So we actually looked at additional layer of personality, then you can start to unfold an unlimited number of opportunities that it's down to us as business leaders to understand their perspectives and churn, churn um, value propositions off the back of it. If I may, for real quick, so you, I think you hit a really interesting point. You talked about how there's diverse consumers out there, right? And you're you're basically saying like, if you're more diverse, you're likely potentially able to make more revenue because your marketing or 
broadening your horizon to a larger population versus being singularly focused, singularly doing the same thing over and over again. But if you look at it in terms of the neurological makeup, and again, I'm not going to use this as kind of like a general statement because I don't do that, but based on my experiences and conversations with others, when you work with people that, for example, have autism, okay, there may be a bit of a, a limitation in terms of empathy or communication or anything like that, but when it comes to processing numbers, when it comes to processing uh, various different um, you know, solutions or problems to solve, they're fantastic. Me, my superpower is problem solving. Give me a problem to solve. Okay, I may fail the first three times, but the third time, I'll master it. And we look at things abstract. So this is where when you bring neurodiversity into the decision-making process within the corporate world, also within startups, within economy as, as general, our minds are processed to solve problems or to see things abstract because our experiences are abstract. Our minds differ. They're not typical to what we have out there. So again, this is the value that can be captured when you embrace neurodiversity uh, and accessibility within um, the workplace. Yes, Harvard Business Reviews talking about 60, you know, companies with greater diversity can be 60% more profitable. Um, as you know at JP Morgan, it isn't just about doing what's right for underserved communities, it's also about understanding diverse, the diversity of our client and customer base. So designing products and services in a vacuum of sameness is really not good business sense. Um, I guess just a couple uh, examples I can give of some of the, our colleagues at JP Morgan where it might have took a little bit more effort to figure out what support they needed, but once we harnessed that, um, on uh, the trade floor, we've got a guy who's nonverbal, um, big guy, when um, he's um, his usual pro process, his usual schedule's disrupted. He can be quite anxious, disruptive on the floor. When he's in his sweet spot, he outperforms our technology. So he's scanning and speed reading is does, which are derivative agreements. And he does so on complex derivative uh, traded instruments that can have 180 different characters. He's got a better accuracy rate than our screen scrape technology. So he could look like this big, awkward, nonverbal guy, but the manager and the team figured out a way to work together. So Avi has his desk and a quiet place to sit, and he has changes to his work patterns, but all those things have been really good for the business, and they wouldn't do without him now. So it takes time and effort, but always worth the investment. That's an amazing story, Heidi. Um, so a lot of times in these conversations, we, we tend to always talk about diversity. And I think in diversity is amazing. But what does accessibility mean? How does that play into the conversation, Heidi, and like with your current role? What does accessibility mean to you? Well, I think most people think about it around entrance and exits into buildings, elevators. Can I get through the turnstile? We think about it a lot more broadly than that. So accessibility is about having a space that feels safe and meets the needs for everybody so that everybody can thrive. So I might have light sensitivity. I might have a visual uh, condition. So sitting up here under bright lights you know, could cause tearing. So thinking about what the setup is. Um, I could be someone who has high or low frequency hearing, so thinking about what the acoustics are. Certainly, wheelchairs, we're in a country and we're operating in a region full of grade two listed buildings. That's difficult to retrofit. We keep pushing barriers and op literally opening doors and figuring out how we can make our spaces more comfortable for our employees and our customers. It takes feedback. It takes resilience by those very people who often get left out or left behind. You know, we were talking about uh, talent. People that have to fight for greater accessibility, people with disabilities, tend to have higher resilience, stick-to-itiveness, follow-through. 
because they've had to fight for access to. I think any underserved or minority population could resonate with that. I was like to add to that as well. Um, so you both come from the financial world, so we're gonna use some financial terms. So assets, you, we, we have to consider our human resources as assets. Whenever you take someone on board in your um, company, it's always the first priority and your obligation to invest in them to get the best output. Now, same way how you would um, you know, invest or you would maintain uh, a property to enhance its value, or you'd um, look at managing a particular company under private equity, you want to put in the right people and the right components to maximize this value proposition. Same thing with people. So I look at accessibility as the root of investing into those that require additional support to maximize the value that they create and establish within the institution. As simple as that. That's amazing. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, when we're talking about accessibility, a lot of times I feel like it's after the fact, like you mentioned, right? We're making the changes. What kind of technology have you seen in the accessibility space that has actually benefited people that don't have a disability? Um, firstly, my motto, I put it on my Black Tech Fest profile, <laughs> which is uh, accessibility by design, not by exception, because it can get frustrating in my line of work where Accessibility is an afterthought, so Agile tends to solve for the majority. We launched Teams recently and you know, it hit about 90% of our population and there's that sticky 10%. How can we make it more accessible for screen scrape technology? Um, to your question in particular, so yeah, I, I encourage anyone out here who's in product development, product design, entrepreneurs, startups, to really think about accessibility during your design phase. Because what happens is you're ready to go to launch and then someone says, did you think about, did you think about, is that gonna interface well with speech to text, text to speech? And it becomes an issue and a problem to solve for. So we're trying to get, even within the bank, product design, investment product, marketing, collateral, thinking about accessibility um, from design. I think I'm gonna answer your question around what technology around accessibility has been the most impactful, and that's definitely gonna be closed captioning. I'm gonna tell you why, and it's great to see it here up high where everybody can read it. Originally it was utilized for people with hearing um, challenges. But actually what we're finding at JP Morgan, the neurodiverse community are loving it. You can control the speed, you can get scripts. So if you've got a processing disorder and following pace of a fast reader or a conversation that's going back and forth. So we now have people with processing disorders and actually people who just struggle to you know, keep up with the dialogue, leveraging closed captioning. But the most important accommodation anybody can make isn't technical, it's empathy. Wow. Costs nothing, empathy. Empathy, powerful. <laughs> How about you? Um, again, I have to um, double down on that. I mean, accessibility, I mean, in our company, even building a platform, before a single line of code is cut, we look at the designs and how we make the engagement and interfaces as accessible as possible. So we bring on board um, top level designers to design multiple different variations of interface to coincide various different you know, requirements, right? And so by doing that, one of the key things, and because the platform we're building is designed to capture information from all of us and use the information to drive better decisions in terms of what types of provisions and accessibility and even things down to technology and services that should be aligned to fit the needs of the individual. What we must always do and what we are doing is ensuring that we can always ensure that when we're building a product, don't build a product for me or for you, for anybody else. Build them for every single type of interaction that's out there. And there's certain elements of AI that's um, in development that could quite literally communicate to the user 
via a chatbot, like a chat GPT type of module. And that type of technology will, will also generate new interfaces that is actually pertaining to the conversational element from the user. So if a user was basically speaking to um, the products and said, you know, I've got issues with my visual elements or maybe autistic or I've got um, dyslexia, so my reading speed is quite low. So it's automatically creating those new environments so that the engagement from the content to the individual is maximized and then the value is then enhanced. So when you look at things such as assistive technologies, I'll give you a funny story. When I first discovered that I was just practicing sex in university, um, one of the things that we got as a benefit was, you know, we've got a MacBook, so we've got a laptop, dictaphone, software. I was like, yo, I've got all this stuff and it's free. I don't have to pay a single penny of it. And I went into the library and I had a whole bunch of mates that were in my course. And I'm like, oh, where did you get that stuff from? I'm like, I'm dyslexic, I'm dyspraxic. You get all this stuff. I'm like, what? I want to go and get it too. I managed to increase the neurodiversity population of King's University London by 25% simply because I walked in with a whole bunch of tech that I got for free at the back of my diagnosis and then they discovered themselves. So it's always essential to embrace technology, especially assistive technologies when it comes to bridging the gap between, well, if I'm unable to carry out a function, by human rights, I should have the opportunity to go and fulfill my function based on the areas of support to platform me up. That's where you've got equity. Accessibility comes with the whole equity within diversity, equity, inclusion. That, that, that's very powerful and impactful. Um, for me, real quick, I feel like the technology that was actually designed for people with disabilities is uh, voice to text, or does anyone have like a Siri or a Google at home, like my home is smart home, and every time I come home, I can have my everything turn on and lights come on and garage doors shut. Like it's fully automated, um, and I feel like it's so. Imp I don't. I wouldn't know what to do without my technology. All right. So, what advice would you give to someone looking to be more aware about diversity or accessibility in the day to day, like in general? I actually wanted to cover the topic of fear of disclosure because my advice is really, and I met so many young graduates yesterday, uh, recent grads or students who are thinking about summer internships, and I continue to get the question about whether or not they should disclose. And I was going to actually ask you when you were sharing your story about your dyslexia and your dyspraxia. You know, at university, they're kind of, schools are teed up for that support. But then you get out in the job market, and there's this fear of disclosure. Like, if I say I'm dyslexic, or I'm neurodiverse, or I have ADHD, I'm not going to get that job. I'm not going to get that same career opportunity. So, yeah, what I was wondering whether you were, I know you started your own company, but when you started your work, were you afraid to disclose or were you open with your? Um, how to answer that question? Um, no, I wasn't afraid. I'm kind of fearless when it comes to these types of things. I, <laughs> I, I, but then I'm, I'm, I'm an, I could be an anomaly. You know, I yeah. can understand there's a lot of other people that um, can grow kind of wary or a bit anxious about their neurological status effectively. And um, I, I want to say, especially coming from the black community, the black community do not like to talk about mental health. It's one of those high stigma points that whenever we discuss it based on the ignorance that we have towards this as a whole wellness topic, um, we tend to put ourselves in categories that we don't want to. And so by that, this whole imposter syndrome that we all have inherited within us, you then got this extra layer of like, okay, I'm black, so I've got this additional level of um, disadvantage, and I'm bloody dyslexic, or I've got ADHD. They are not going to have a chance. No, 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 no. The way you work, for number one, in terms of answering your question, anyone that's here, you're doing the first thing right. Being in conversations where we're talking about this topic, for you to be enlightened to the concept of the university. Once you're enlightened to the concept of the university, go through your self-discovery moment. So do a test. Um, go and speak to whoever's out there that can guide you towards getting an assessment done so you can get an official diagnosis or status being identified. And then do some research to understand in terms of your condition or your superpower, what are the elements of it that basically kind of lock your true potential. By that discovery, find people of like mind. 
join groups, join societies, be part of a, frater a fraternity or sorority of people that have similar experiences to you so they can encourage you and therefore you're in that environment that you can only go that way. Amazing, amazing. Um, this is fantastic. Um, I'll give you guys a chance here. I know we're at time, but uh, a last word you'd like to share with everyone. Yeah, we're just really proud to have had the opportunity to be an accessibility sponsor this year, Black Tech Fest. Um, we're both from the Office of Disability Inclusion. I see our European uh, DEI lead sitting in the audience as well. Come by and have a chat with us. No questions should be scary. Um, we can give you advice. We can share um, more stories with you or point you to some resources. But my advice would be don't be afraid to ask for what you need to thrive. And for me, um, I'll just leave everyone with a saying that I say to myself every day and I use it as a philosophy in my company. Um, if you want to unlock your superpower, say this to yourself. If you want the best from me, I need the best around me. By achieving that, you'll unlock my full potential. Wow. Well, thank you both for taking the time to speak today. And I'll ask the audience here, Black Tech Fest 2023, please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.